So Tim Wicks, uh, head coach. Um, Wicko, as, as the lads know me, been at Sandal for about 27 years with a few um, sort of disappearing, honing some coaching skills in between at all the clubs. I was coming back here to, to finish my years, let's say. I'm Alex Edler, I'm the director of rugby and current player. I've been with Sandal uh, for 10 years. This is my 10th year, 10th season. From, from my side of things, a bit, bit hot and cold. Um, so there's, there's lots of pluses that have come out of it and some, and some negatives. I think the hard part for me was like obviously how we started the season. Um, I think that got us into a bit of a downward spiral mentality. Um, we, we played maybe four or five games against some of the hardest teams. We had a really tough start and just narrowly missed out on. I think cumulative, like we'd lost six games by a total of 16 points. And that got us into a bit of a, a negative mindset. And to recover from that um, was hard for us. Uh, I think obviously then it showed like with the Christmas break and stuff, we managed to, to pull that together in the run that we've put together since that has obviously kept us, us safe from relegation. Similar to what we can see, the inconsistency has been so frustrating. We've gone fantastic victory, disappointing loss. In some instances, we've not had a really good run of victories, whereas last year we've put together 10 from 12, I think it was, at the second part of the season. To, to change things slightly on that, since Christmas, things have been really, really positive. We sat down with the group and said, things have got to improve if we want to save relegation, which wasn't a conversation we ever wanted to have, but we knew it was a reality. We need to have a better buy-in, and since that point, I think things have been massively, massively improved. There have still been a couple of results that we certainly want to forget about, but to have got ourselves to where we are now, when we thought things were going to be a, mo a lot more um, negative, I think has been a good outcome. I think, I think there's there's a couple. I think we we obviously sat down with the lads, like I said, we, we've got a, a better buy-in and more accountability. Um, we managed to overturn that that, neg that negative spiral, that mindset. Um, the introduction of Woody has been huge. Um, he's taken a lot of detail on on defensively. So whilst I was wanting to change our shape and wanting to progress things from an attacking perspective and change things up there, he's just really drilled down on the, the defensive detail, which has made us a lot more solid. So actually, if you look at the last five or six games, we, we haven't really been, other than the odd blip, we haven't really been conceding many tries, so that I think it was a foundation to, to go from. I'd agree with coaching's improved Woody's come in and added a lot. He's a, he's a fantastic leader, he's got a lot of credibility in the group because he was club captain down here for 10 years and probably amassed 300 caps in that time. Um, and I think we, we put the responsibility a bit more back onto the players. I think at the start of the season it was very much coaching led and we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this, you need to get it. And then post Christmas I think the lads have gone right. The coaches can't do it on the field for us. We as a group have got to pull our socks up and there's been some, some massive changes in performance. Some players have really stepped up and gone, I'm underperforming, I know I'm a better player than that, I need to contribute more to this side. And that, as a result, has had a really good knock-on effect on the rest of the group and our standards in training, punctuality, standards around the club, and then ultimately on a Saturday have been, have been fantastic. I think Edler kind of alluded onto it, onto it earlier. Um, the first half of the season was very much coach-led. Like we were trying to drive, for, drive through a new shape. And actually at that meeting, it was kind of just reinforcing, like, this is where we're at. This is what the situation looks like. Um, and trying to get the lads to, to, in effect, take over that accountability themselves. Um, like, once they get on a pitch on, on Saturday, there's nothing we can do. We can train throughout the week. Um, and tweak what we want to work on. Ultimately, they have to put that in play on a Saturday. The accountability is the, the key takeover from it. It's I talk about standards a lot within the group and what do we expect, what are you expected to do as a player at Sandal and a lot of it is admin. You know, we have instances where we're chasing people on a Thursday evening for availability. Now, we can't afford to have that. We've got an app that tracks availability that just wasn't being used. It was probably between us making 30 phone calls a week and sending God knows how many text messages to see if people are available. The, the, what we basically said was, if you want to play for Sandal, these are, these are the standards that are expected from us as a coaching group, but from the rugby club moreover. You know, we, we've got a fantastic setup here. If you don't want to play for us, you, 
you're absolutely not obliged to, but we make it a really good place to play rugby, a great place to be, but your standards have got to be there to be part of that. And it, it, the, the, the difference is black and white, it's been fantastic. I think the easiest part of that is if I, if I touch on last season. So yeah, we took over halfway through the season, and, and similar to this season, we'd started off a kind of a negative, a negative run, um, and we just kind of reinforced like like last year the standards. We didn't really change much style of play. Um, we got a bit of availability back. We got some players back from injury, and once we started to get those one or two wins, that then changes morale. Like it, the whole. Ethos around the club changes when you when you're in a negative spell. It's really hard to drag drag yourself out of. So you need to find a win from somewhere. In effect, and I think that's kind of that's kind of what happened this season. Like we we pinpointed some games where we thought that's going to be a tough game. Um, that's going to be a tough game. That should be maybe a season defining point where we could we could turn it round. Um, and then we get weather that changes that and how it looks and stuff. But I think ultimately. We delivered what we wanted, what our expectations were, and then once you ground out a win, however it came, it might not have been pretty, it might have been an anic where we put 50 on type thing, but those then breed confidence and actually where your shape has been questioned or where your tactics have been questioned in previous weeks, once you start to get the results, people start to go off program less, like the buy-in gets better, the belief gets better. Uh, and I think that's generally, that keeps morale high itself. Like the lads being here, the lads wanting to get the results. No one plays rugby because they want to lose, do they? They play because they want to win ultimately and have fun at the same time. Um, and once you start to get that upward spiral, that, that, that breeds success in itself. Yes, yeah, so I think the way to the, the thing to start there is looking at where we were probably five years ago, where we didn't really have a second team. We had a first team squad that was very segregated and we had, I don't know, five or six second team games a year and you got people who come to training but never got a look in. That has changed massively and I know you interviewed George, Rich and, and Nolsey a couple of weeks ago, but the work that those guys have put into building a squad, building an ethos and you know, George said, you know, making it a fun place to play rugby has been huge. At the start of the season, you know, the training numbers from the second team were absolutely keeping us going because we, because the buy-in from as we've spoken about from the first team just wasn't good enough. And it's something that if you've got a good second team, you've got naturally a good first team because people are pushing each other on. And you know, compared to other clubs that we know of, and I'm certainly not going to name names, but first and second teams train completely separately. They don't socialise with one another, whereas that is absolutely not the case here. We've got a group of mates who are absolutely best mates whether they play first team second team or run touch you know we've got a really good tight-knit group and it's absolutely what our identity is about we, we want to be a great place there will be a great place to be and you know you can't build a good squad without having good mates in that group um, something that we're looking on is improving this facility and, and that we want to keep people here this room that we're in you can't obviously see from the angle that we're on but this has been renovated the room next door has been renovated it's it's somewhere you can spend your Saturday and have a good time and whether you're playing rugby, whether you're injured, whether you're coming down to watch, it's all part of what we're trying to drive forward as a rugby club. Um, touching on the second team, you know, we spoke about George, Nolsey and, and Rich, that you know, they've done a fantastic job and that's showing the results. We know we're heading into a playoff game in a couple of weeks' time for the second team and ultimately by the end of the season they'll have probably played more games than the first team, which certainly hasn't happened in our history that I'm aware of and I can absolutely guarantee it doesn't happen at many other clubs. Uh, in the county. Just to, to add on to that, I think the one thing we've got is so we've got all the, the, those senior squads training together. I think the biggest thing that we've established probably over the last two years is, is getting those players back to the club that are sand on and juniors. So if you look through our team sheet for the first team and second team, you're going to be looking at over 90% like homegrown players. So we're not going out trying to get players from other clubs as such. We're just trying to keep in touch with those lads that are actually done a long period of time within the club itself, maybe gone off to university, not played rugby for two or three years and I'm back at the club. And, and there's probably maybe four or five players that are, are regular first team starters that have actually left rugby ha behind for maybe a year, two, three, and are now back loving it and playing rugby again. I think that's a real key thing for us. Coming from a club with such a strong minis and juniors and sections to ignore that would be stupid. So it's how can we, how can we tap into that? And how can we make sure that that 
and knows that he did allude to it. How can we make sure that that production line in effect gets, gets all the way up to the first team? I think experience is, is, is probably one of the, the biggest areas. So like at the end of last season, we kind of looked at our coaching setup and we looked at where we needed to to bring in some some support. And like we've got a young squad. We've probably got the youngest squad in the league by far uh, when you look at average age. And actually, it was looking at, like like we've said, like looking at those homegrown players, looking at those previous Sandal players that have got connections here. And, and Tom was the one that jumped out to me and, and I've played with him in the past. And it was like, actually, he wants to get into a bit of coaching. He's a really experienced player. He's played at Nat 2 for and above for God knows how long, 10 years or so. And what could he bring to us? And I think it's just, it's just his knowledge base that he brings and his standards that he drives. Because especially across that back line, that's probably the youngest part of the squad. Um, for me, then Deck is, I like you said, Deck, Deck, Deck is what Deck is, but. Deck, Deck is Deck, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, the season before he left here was a COVID season and confident saying he was the best player in the league. He was absolutely devastating. And as a result of that, I got spotted by other clubs and went over to Harrogate and then Hull Ionians. And actually, I think probably got a bit frustrated with his rugby there and didn't have that freedom to play and that freedom to be the, the big dog. And that's where we get our best out of him when Deck Thompson's on song and, and has confidence he is a devastating rugby player. And there's been times this season where that's not been quite there, but certainly the last five, six games, he's been fantastic. He, he also has, like what he said, it is absolutely experience and running a line out talking with confidence to the group you know when Deck speaks people listen to him and he comes with ideas he comes to us with ideas and he's happy to put his hand up and go I'm going to put my neck on line this is something we need to do and more often than not it's it's a positive for me I'll, I'll just give you two names and I think that it, it, it's an easy one in the sense that they're not two that necessarily stand out they're probably two players that have drifted between first and second team throughout the course of the season um, and for me, that's, that's Rich Carr and Cameron Vega. Um, funnily enough, they're both lads that have moved to the area, that just came to the club out of the blue and said, can I play rugby there? Obviously, they played rugby prior to coming here. Um, very rarely miss a training session. Their attitude's spot on. And, and you'd expect that those are probably the lads that would get disgruntled because they are dropping between ones and twos. Um, so you're having to manage the, those conversations. But actually, any time you tell them they're playing in the twos, they're like, yeah, that's fine, crack on. By the way, put in a performance, and then when the opportunity comes back with the first team, and I'd say maybe maybe more so over the last three or four weeks, both of those have been absolutely invaluable. They've both been given an opportunity to play first team, and they're probably not far off being some of the first names in that, that first team squad now for selection. And that's just dropping down, putting in performances, in effect, showing that they can't be can't be ignored, um, and then p replicating that performance when they step up to the first team. Some of me, I'll, I'll name two as well, and they're, they're both forwards because that's my area of expertise. But uh, Archie Milner, first and foremost, he uh, probably had a very frustrating season last year where he was similar to Cam and Rich, I suppose, flittering between the first and second team. But at the back end of the season, sort of, he was certainly in the eighteen. And then we went on the cup run. He was absolutely a first name on the team sheet for in the back row. Um, came down at the start of the season was was a I think it's fair to say probably a maybe, but definitely would have a role to play in the first team. I can't think of a time where he hasn't been in the A team other than when he's perhaps not been available or injured. And then his good mate uh, Will Hodgkiss again came down at the start of the season and got injured playing club cricket somehow. Sorry, Will wasn't fit was carrying a bit of weight and completely self-driven has gone, I'm going to set a different standard for myself, has lost weight, has got fit. And some of the performances he's put in this year have been totally outstanding. He's worked in his scrummaging, his tackling is devastating, his ball carrying is arguably one of the best in the, in the pack at the moment. And he's a player we, we certainly wouldn't want to miss out on. Um, but this time last year, again, he was probably a fringe player and has seen that opportunity and goes, I want to play first team for Sandal and put his hand up and has taken a chance. Something that we've been discussing the last couple of weeks, I suppose. I mean, we, we speak to each other more or less every day with different rugby dramas that we're dealing with. But one thing that has to improve is, is again, it's that word standards. Is we spend 
as coaches at tops three hours a week with the group. And we've not got a lot of time to do extras within that. You know, we can coach, we can do a bit of fitness, we can do this, but if people want Sandal to be as successful as they can be, they've also got to take a little bit on themselves. So pre-season essentially starts for those lads a week on Sunday. You know, we don't want people to come back to pre-season to get fit. We need them to come back fit to get fitter. So get in the gym, look after any injuries you've got. Look at other teams, you know, we play against some teams that have got some real athletes in there and sort of try and emulate that. If we can be fitter, stronger, healthier, you know, look after ourselves a bit better so we're not worrying about injuries. We can name the same 18 week in, week out. That ultimately is going to have a much, a, a big knock on effect. And then if one of the, you know, kingpins in the side chooses to up their standards, that again has a knock on effect for the rest of the group. Uh, I think from, from my side of things, it's probably more more about culture um, over the summer. So yeah, we've talked about driving those standards, driving that accountability, some of the stuff that we've touched on this season, but actually probably creating a, a more professional environment. Um, so doing more detailed season planning, play, making players more account, accountable on an individual basis. So looking at IDPs, looking at their individual development, um, what do players need to work on specifically themselves, giving them time to do that with either pre or post sessions, just so that the lads that we've got here um, are still developing. Like I said, we've got a young squad. There's a lot of development to be had there, a lot of game understanding, a lot of tactical learning, and it's, it's giving them the tools over the course of the season to to kick on to the next level. Like if we can get the best out of the lads that we've got at, at present, I think we've probably got one of the best squads within the league, um, and it's more a case of can we drive them on? Can we? Can those players get better? Um, so yeah, we don't need to go out and recruit or anything like that. And there may be, there may be times when we do, um, but actually, can we drive the standards in our own players? Can they constantly improve? Like if you're a 24 year old player, where where will you be at 28? Actually, there's, there's loads of learning to be had there. So I think for me, that's a key area of preseason. Hundred percent. Well, Ben Booth. Like, it's not about as much now, but both are equally horrendous. Oh God! Late to train. Uh, Eden Kelly. Okay. Uh, probably Alex Edler, to be fair. James Briscoe. Luke Adams. Me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Hedge. <laughs> I've already done scouts and I never want to do that again. Jack O'Hara, the idea is horrendous. So, as horrible as it sounds, I'll take Handley. Jack Handley. <laughs> 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 you'll, you'll hate that. <laughs> Brilliant, man.